Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down with Burlington, Ontario Deputy Mayor Rory Neeson. But before we get into our interview with the Deputy Mayor, I just want to take a moment and ask you to do us a favor. Hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to this or even watching this. It helps us get our message out, and we couldn't do this show without you. Now, on to the interview. Uh, Deputy Mayor Neeson, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with sort of the overarching question about who you are and why you got involved in politics. And it's a question I've asked every single municipal politician who's ever come on the show. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Rory? Interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, very much for having me on the program. Uh, Chris, if I may call you Chris, and you at least feel free to call me Rory. I don't mind at all. Um, so, um, you know, it uh, you have to go back to the beginning, I think. Um, as a uh, when I when I was growing up, I had a couple parents who really instilled the value of public service to me and caring for others. So uh, both of my parents were uh, psychotherapists, actually. Um, my father uh, ran a practice uh, where uh, they charged people on a sliding scale based on what they could afford to pay. Uh, I don't think you see that too often where people could actually pick uh, what they pay and it it led to uh it led to being able to help as many people as possible. He specialized in children as as well. So um between the two of them, uh my mother had a great uh, has a great love for history and uh a great love for archaeology and seeing the past and uh the role of the past in the present and uh that led uh, me into a uh into a bachelor degree in in um, political science with a minor in history, it was always uh, the the value was always instilled that the you know the, the the best career that you could have would be one where you're actually helping other people, and so that uh, that led me into the federal public service uh, at Global Affairs, and I was there for over a decade, um, but I wanted to make more of a direct difference for people. I wanted to be able to see and feel the difference I was making in my community uh, and beyond. And uh, thankfully, uh, I've been able to do that in this uh, role as a city councillor and now as a deputy mayor. So Rory, I, I want to know, uh, was municipal politics discussed at the dinner table growing up? You talk about how your family was involved giving back through their uh, work, but was politics discussed at the dinner table, particularly municipal? Not so much, no, um, to be honest with you. You know, municipal politics is something that is there when you need it. Uh, but a lot of people do go about their uh, their their lives uh, without seeing uh, seeing uh, right in front of their right in front of the tip of their fingers what's going on municipally. So when I was growing up, no, we didn't talk a lot of municipal politics, but uh, you know, uh, I do recall uh, I found out later that uh, my dad had uh, helped to uh, ensure that uh, an overpass uh, in Burlington near where I grew up had a higher rail on it to, to help uh, protect some kids. He worked with my predecessor, actually. I didn't know that until I was elected. So that was pretty cool. So what happens in 2018 that makes you finally say, OK, this is the time that I'm going to finally put my name forward and run for Burlington City Council? Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I try to do a little bit of research on people, but I believe this is the first election you run in and you actually put your name on a ballot, correct? It was my first election. I had tried a, uh, a nomination uh, federally uh, before that. So it was uh, so that was this was my second foray really into politics. But this time I was uh, really serious, uh, quite serious about it. I, well, I was serious before, too, but uh, I was really in it to win at this time, because although I really enjoyed my work in the federal public service, I, uh, I, I really I wanted to make more of a direct difference for people. I wanted that that sort of feeling that at the end of the day that you were helping. So um, I took it really seriously. I took some time off work and, uh, and I ran uh, full time for, for several months. 
And what was going on in the city of Burlington at the time that because you don't just randomly wake up one day and say, OK, I'm going to try and give back in this way. Was there an issue going on or did you see that your voice would be beneficial around that council table to say, OK, the issues that are present in the city of Burlington today? I, I think I have somewhat of a voice that can give a different perspective onto the issues that are being talked about. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, when I was elected, I was the, uh, the youngest member of, uh, of council and I, uh, the, the council of, uh, 2018 before the election was certainly, uh, an older group, uh, with a lot of wisdom, uh, a lot of smarts, but, uh, lacking that younger voice. So, uh, I wanted to provide that voice and be a, a real advocate for the environment, for public transit because Burlington had good public transit in the 2000s, but it had uh, gradually withered away. And uh, I thought we needed to bring that back as part of the uh, the way that we would fight climate change and also provide quality of life uh, for our, our residents. So those are a couple of the issues. Also uh, development issues in Burlington in 2018. Burlington was changing fast. There were some concerns, not with uh, not with growth, but with how the growth was happening. And there seemed to be a disconnect between uh, residents and their elected leaders on uh, growth in, in downtown Burlington in particular, which is kind of the gem, uh, a gem of a gem of Burlington for sure. We have this beautiful park uh, downtown and people really wanted to uh, protect the character of Burlington while uh, growing, while changing and the inevitability of change. Now, you've been on council now for roughly five years. We're coming up to the fifth year because October is usually election season in Ontario. Um, and during that time, I'm assuming, and then this is a big assumption here, that you've probably had to make some tough choices. You don't get elected and then have to go through a pandemic without having to make some tough choices. The affordability crisis that's been going on, you have to make some tough choices about the service levels that are provided, the budget and all that. Has it been easy? Has it been a challenging last five years on municipal uh, governance? Because as our friend would say, the president of FCM, Scott Pierce, you are the government of proximity. And the moment you make a choice and the decision, it impacts your residents the next day. So over the last five years, looking back retrospectively, has it been uh, what you expected when you first put your name forward in 2018? Hmm. You know, uh, I tried not to expect too much because uh, it was such a change from what I had been doing. Um, and, uh, you know, you can attend the meetings and uh, try follow along with the agendas and say, oh, I would have voted this way or I would have voted that way. But till you're in there, uh, until uh, you have a good understanding of how the municipality works and you sort of see, uh, see all of the machinery of uh, local government, that's only when you can really... Um, start to have a complete understanding. So um, so no, it was not exactly what I expected. But I try to keep my uh, I try to keep my eyes open and just be willing to to change. Of course, yeah, we get elected in late 2018 and then you're just trying to uh, you know figure out where the bathroom is, trying to get your some of your campaign promises uh, going and I had an early success there which we can talk about later but um, then, you know, you got your, you get a year under your belt and you're like, okay, you know, I think I'm kind of figuring this place out. I, I see how I can bring motions. I see how I can work with my staff. I begin to understand how the region works versus the local municipality, maybe see what's going on at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, getting the larger context. And then we get like just smacked with the pandemic. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, municipalities had an important role during the pandemic. We were the face of a lot of the uh, a lot of the measures that occurred or we were trying to uh, help people a lot. You know, the job changed completely to a point where I was delivering groceries uh, to my residents at, at some points. Um, so it just, uh, it, you know, and then that changed. And then now we're in this cost of living crisis. So uh, it is, I think, uh, I believe uh, unusual uh, what we've gone through the last five years, uh, yet that's made it all the more rewarding, actually, and more impactful. You're making uh, important, uh, really important decisions, uh, particularly around public health in, the, in that time period that were really, uh, really heavy stuff, right? Very heavy stuff. I'm, I'm going to zig a little bit here because you just mentioned some of the priorities that you put forward in that first campaign and that you 
I'm assuming got reelected on as well to continue on in the last election or new campaign promises. What's been your biggest priority around that council table for yourself to deliver to the people of not only of Ward 3, but the people of Burlington as well? Sure. I I think that um, the my overarching priority has been to uh, make investments in the future of Burlington, to make investments today that will ensure the long term viability of the of the city, the success and to ensure that our residents are thriving. Uh, in Burlington, not just getting by, but actually thriving in our community. And Burlington is a great place to live. And it was a great place to live in 2018. It's a great place to grow up uh, in the 90s. Um, but uh, I I feel, you know, I still feel a uh, drive to keep doing more and doing better as the world changes. And, you know, where that rubber has hit the road uh, often has been around environmental issues, actually. Um, uh, pandemic notwithstanding, the climate crisis is both the the challenge and the opportunity of our time. So how do you balance the needs of investment in the future with the needs of investment in today? Because you're there to represent the people who elected you and those who potentially didn't vote for you. And you're there to represent the entire city and look to the city as a whole to the future. But people are here and now, and you have to balance the needs of the future with what's going on now. How do you see your role as councillor and deputy mayor in balancing those two aspects of wanting to invest into the future, but remembering that people are here potentially struggling and potentially trying to figure out how they're going to live day to day? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be a, uh, a zero sum game. Uh, between today and the future. Fortunately, there are many ways where we can help people today that's also going to support them in the future. For example, uh, by uh, funding uh, more buses uh, on the road and by um, supporting expanded uh, free transit for seniors or for students like we have in Burlington, we're helping those who are less fortunate to be able to get around our city and not have to pay for an expensive uh, depreciating asset, uh, polluting asset that is the automobile. So to the extent that we can help people uh, with their cost of living through public transit, we're helping them today. But by making those investments, those buses last 10 years. So we're paying, we've got those dividends for 10 years and we're setting the standard for our transit going uh, forward more than 10 years. And, you know, soon I hope we'll have our first uh, big electric buses on the road. And when we do, then we'll be helping even more uh, in terms of uh, the environment. And on the flip side of that, you you get elected at, at a ward level, but you're there to represent the city. When you make decisions, though, you have to make decisions based on the city, which sometimes may fly in contradiction of what your ward residents want or they see as a, ben a need for them. How do you balance the, the role of local representation with city representation? Yeah, it's, uh, it can <laughs> the be interesting. tough questions are coming out here, Rory. Yeah, all right, Chris. Okay, yeah, here we go. Okay. Uh, no, I appreciate it. Um, normally, there, like 99.9% .9 of the times, there's no conflict between what's best for your ward and what's best for your city. Um, so this is good. You're the first person um, to say that to me, Rory. Oh, really? Eh? Yeah. Well, you know what? We have a great uh, council here in Burlington. We work as a team most of the time. Uh, and so we look out for each other and we're, we support each other. Um, you know, there's a, just as an example, there was a, there's a golf course that uh, staff, a municipal golf course that staff are looking to maybe reducing from 18 to nine holes. Well, there's a lot of golfers who are not happy about that. Uh, so I went to that meeting, even though, the uh, the golf course isn't in my ward and there's not a ton of golfers in my ward per se that were there. I think there's only a couple people from my ward there, but I went there to, to listen, of course, and cause it's going to be a council decision eventually, but also to support my fellow counselor uh, and, and help him and back him up because uh, we all need to explain to our constituents from time to time, how we have to have the whole city uh, in mind and not just our, our own ward. So how do you get over that? I think through uh, good communication and transparency with your residents, you can explain to them and have a dialogue about what's best for the city. And then hopefully they'll agree with you for the most part. 
Uh, now, it, I mean, it doesn't always work. Sometimes you'll have like a local project that you really want to get done that doesn't get done because there's not enough budget for it, for example. But, um, you know, that's uh, that's always a challenge. Uh, budget is often where the rubber hits the road on these things. You talk about listening, which is a key word that I want to pick up on here for a second, because you, you, you have to listen to not just people in your own social economic echo chamber, the social medias, the people at the coffee shops that you hang out with your friends. You have to listen to dissenting voices as well. And when you go into that council chambers, you have to have an idea of gauging what your residents want, but also where you're going to lie, but not be cemented into an idea of how you're going to vote because something could come up at the council meeting. How much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself to listen to both sides of every issue, but also understand that you have to make the ultimate decision, which could impact people, good, bad, or indifferent? Yeah, I mean, that's why you're there, though, right? Like, if you're running for office, you're running because you want to sit in the chair and put your hand up, right? I love voting. That's my favorite part. I like voting every four years before I was elected, and now I vote on a monthly basis all the time uh because i i believe in myself and my ability to uh to uh, balance all those interests and to do the right thing so um now i completely lost your question but uh but still it's still stimulating. It, 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 so is you. listening easy <laughs> is listening easy particularly uh, in today's society where we're seeing more people being vocal and i say vocal in the nicest way possible to being able to say, okay, I have to respectfully listen to you and you have to respectfully give me uh, what you your concerns are, but in a respectful manner. How much listening do you do in your job compared to previous jobs? Yeah. Uh, oh, listening is is absolutely critical. It's critical in every work environment. It's a, it's actually sort of like a key to success, I think, uh, in the corporate world or, or public sector. But um you know, I would say uh, listening is a really important uh, part of the job, but uh, related to that. And I think, you know, when I meet with people a lot who are interested in local politics, maybe you want to run in the future, I want to promote people uh, and support them. And the first question I, I, or the first thing I want to know is, are you patient? <laughs> How patient are you? <laughs> because patience is the most uh, important quality of a politician, in my opinion. And it's not um, it's not something you're born with. It's a muscle that you can you can flex and and develop. Uh, and uh, I have developed it over time for sure. Um, so listening is a big part of that uh, of that patience. But if you're not if you're not a patient person, if you can't uh, let people, if you have trouble letting people finish their sentences, for example, uh, when you feel you're right or 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 quote unquote know that you're right. Um, you'll have a hard time with this uh, job, uh, which is a contradiction because you also have to have a lot of confidence in yourself to be in this role. Uh, you will get eaten up if you don't have self-confidence, if you don't believe in yourself and your own decision-making capacity. So it's a, that is a, it's a tough job for that reason. Does it get easier though? Because for those who are listening right now, who, who just heard that statement, who are thinking, okay, there's two years left in Alberta till the next municipal election. There's a year until Saskatchewan heads to the polls. People are running for by-elections across this country municipally, and they're saying, okay, I might have the patience, but does it get easier to get learn, learn that patience in the role? Because I can imagine Rory from 2018 is not the same Rory of 2023 when it regards patience and dealing with issues that are coming up on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, it does. It does get uh, easier. I think for, for many people, it gets easier. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you have the stress of the role. You have the complaints uh, rolling in, right? Uh, so uh, you develop uh, perhaps some, some shield uh, towards negativity. And, uh, and that can be, uh, that, that's a good thing, uh, in terms of your work, uh, life, but you also have to keep who you are. Right. Uh, so that's the hard part about being a local politician is you are, you do have to have a shield up, uh, to some extent to handle criticism, uh, to be willing to take criticism on. Yes. But also to know sometimes that, uh, to, to believe in yourself, uh, I grant sometimes unfair criticism, or her, even harassment. Uh, so uh, that's the flip side of uh, of it. it. So it does get easier in terms of patience, I think, because at some point you, it's not that you've heard it all before, but you've heard similar things. You've, you've sort of uh, 
had, you know, like an, an upset person who comes into my office to have a conversation. I know better than ever how to how to work with them, to make them uh, calm down, to get to the bottom of, of their issue and to get them to leave in a feeling good. Right. Um, that's a skill that you develop over time. Can I ask you a question off topic, but in similar vein here? And I apologize if it comes out of left field, but I I I, I like asking this question because I, I I give hope to people who are listening to this with this question. Is there an apathy in uh, or un- understanding, I should say, an understanding of the jurisdictional roles that each level of government plays in every day's every in people's everyday life in Burlington? So would would you have people coming to you and talking to you about provincial issues or federal issues, or are they understanding that the municipal government deals with X, Y, and Z compared to passports that are federal or education or healthcare that are usually more provincial? Are people Do people understand the jurisdictional roles and responsibilities of the different levels of government in Burlington? You know, I think they're more sophisticated than you might think. Um, I don't get a lot of questions that are way off topic or where I have to move people to the federal government or the provincial government. Um, uh, most of my questions are are actually quite municipally driven. Um, I remember getting more of those in the early days. Um, and um, and I think uh, I think this council here in Burlington, uh, communication transparency has been a big big thing for us. So uh, I think that leads to some learning uh, from everyone. Um, so, you know, in the last 12 months, if I had half a dozen questions that were off topic, that would be, that would be about right. Um, so, so we're doing okay here. Yeah. And, you know, uh, we have some great representation provincially and federally, so they're out there too. So you're hearing from them and, and it seems that, you know, of course the province and the federal government are in the news a lot. So that seems to be, that seems to be helping. Um, do you, so like I don't get apathy? passport questions, you know, like I don't, I don't get passport questions, for example. Right. Um, so, uh, so yeah. Um, is there an apathy when it comes to actually approaching counselors like yourself or a deputy mayor like yourself, or do people actually want to give their feedback on issues because you can go out and try to get people to engage with you about the issues of the day, but if they don't give you that feedback back, then you're just basically hopefully not speaking to your echo chamber, but you're going to be speaking to people that you already know. Do people actually engage with you and actually want to talk about the issues that Burlington is facing? People do, okay. um, but, but not everybody, <laughs> not everybody. So if I have 26,000 constituents, more or less then you know, maybe 500 to a thousand of them are the ones that I'll hear from. Uh, and then you're not sure what the other 25,000 are doing. Like, what are they up to? Are they, are they good? You know, are they, are they happy? Are they mad? Uh, are they apathetic or are they just busy? Uh, so that's why it's, uh, you know, uh, door knocking is so important uh, at election time, but also uh, off election, if you can make a little time for it to just try to get a more representative sample of your residents and, and where they're at and how they're feeling, you know, how, how are they impacted by the cost of living crisis, for example? Um, you know, you, you, we hear a lot from the squeaky wheels in our inboxes and in our, and on the other end of the phone line, and that's okay. Right. They have legitimate issues that need to be resolved, but uh, often, you know, uh, it's parents of young children who are just way too busy to be involved municipally. Or it's the 20-somethings who uh, don't have, uh, you know, weren't uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know, didn't get that impression of municipal politics when they were in high school uh, uh, to a large extent. So it doesn't, maybe it doesn't impact them as much or they don't think it does. Uh, but uh, when you talk to them and you learn their issues, you realize that you could be uh, helping them as well. I want to turn to segment two now and because I'm cautious of time and I want to talk about the city of Burlington as a whole. But before I ask the first question, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the deputy mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is the deputy mayor's opinion. I don't know why, but we get emails about this question often. So here we go. Okay. Deputy Mayor, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what do you believe, and I say you as you, the Deputy Mayor, Rory, is do you believe is the biggest issue facing the city of Burlington today as of recording? Hmm. I think it is uh, the cost of living crisis today. 
uh, I think that is the most acute issue that people are facing. Our uh, food banks are being uh, used uh, to a greater extent than ever. Um, our food recovery, um, uh, food recovery NGO is being uh, used constantly. Um, we have uh, tents in our city for the first time. Um, we have uh, poverty inside our homes. Uh, people struggling to get by living in basements. The housing prices are uh, more than half of that cost of living issue. Uh, grocery prices, uh, cost of gas, uh, cost of new vehicles and used vehicles. Uh, so, you know, in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you're struggling to get by with your shelter and your food, it's hard to to be involved in in other things. So, um, in term, you know, and, and Burlington is an affluent community, a very affluent community, frankly, um, better off than the vast majority of community communities. We're so lucky here, but it's affecting us as well. And so that to me, that's probably the number one issue, like you said, today. Um, and since I'm only allowed to say one, that's all I'm going to no, say. No, you can say two or three if you want, <laughs> because we've had people list off six things so are there other issues because before i get into this uh the line of questioning here are there other issues that you see uh facing burlington right now outside of the affordability crisis because the affordability crisis is, is, it encompasses a lot of issues that you talk about but are there more other is, are there other issues that are facing the community as well yeah i think you know the flip side of that coin is the climate crisis actually uh climate change uh, because we're running out of time on this one uh before the impacts will be quite uh quite significant on burlington um burlington had a, a really bad flood back in 2014 um that you know made headline headline news it was uh, I can't quote you exactly how much it all came at once in, in less than an hour, flooding of the basements, that sort of thing. And we know there's going to be more of that in the future. Um, Burlington, like all over Ontario, was affected by the wildfires this summer. So we're trying to build a community where you can live and play and and uh, and uh, be happy or content, uh, get around easily, uh, and enjoy your family in a community. And it's hard to do that when you can't go outside because of the wildfires. It's hard to do that after uh, another ice storm or ice event or when the, you know, it gets harder when the snow is uh, less but comes all at once. Um, and when we don't have nice springs or nice falls that uh, impacts it, the heat waves. Um, so we know it's going to get worse in Burlington as well as the rest of the country. And uh, if that's also going to impact people's quality of life in the long run. So I want to start with the affordability crisis that you talk about. This is not just a municipal issue. This is a provincial and federal issue. You talk about your MPPs and your MPs that you have in Burlington. And I know from being in Ontario, living in Ontario and covering Ontario politics for some time, Burlington has more than one MP and more than one MPP as well. Um this affordability issue is an all hands on deck crisis that everyone needs to come to the table. What is the city of Burlington doing in the short term until these conversations happen, until they figure out how all levels of government can come together to address this issue doing today to make sure that they're not piling on to the affordability crisis that people are struggling with right now? Yeah, it's a uh, it's it's a challenge. It really is, uh, Chris. I I think um, I think that municipalities, uh, as you know, as an experienced uh, municipal observer, we uh, we well, I'm sure Scott told you how we have sixty percent of the infrastructure and nine percent of the of the tax uh, intake. So it doesn't leave uh, much for 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 other things like tackling uh, cost of living. But in uh, the things that we can do and are doing in Burlington um, are expanding uh, free transit uh, because we know transportation is a major cost after after your mortgage. It's usually the second uh, largest cost along with food. So uh, we recently added free transit for students on the evenings and weekends, which we will expand to all day upon uh, negotiating with the school boards um, for the high school students. Uh, we made transit free for seniors all day. Um, and um, 
beyond that, uh, on the affordability, well, we're approving, we're approving uh, housing units, left, right, and center. They are moving through our system quickly. Uh, unfortunately, um, I can't pick up my hammer and build these houses myself. If I, if I could, uh, well, I, you know, I'd be out there right now, probably. Um, but we can't do that. Uh, but we are, we do have an affordable housing strategy, and we are uh, looking to tap into the federal, uh, uh, was it the Housing Accelerator Fund, uh, to get more housing, affordable, uh, attainable housing here in Burlington. So that's another way. And then you also have to look at. Well, of course, the the those who are less fortunate. So in Halton, we're really, again, lucky that we have uh, Halton region uh, managing our homelessness uh, issue. So we have a bed for every person in need in Halton region. We wow. have a spot for everyone. I mean, isn't that how it should be? Like, that's how it should be across oh, the country. And it only, should, and only but you never hear that floors. actually coming true. So yeah. it's just shocking. Yeah. Only in the most affluent uh, region, uh, the safest region in Canada, do we have that privilege of uh, being able to do that. But it should be that way across the country. So uh, when people are experiencing homelessness, our, our staff are able to go up and talk to them and tell them we have a spot for them. They can be on their own if they need to. We bought a hotel uh, for women and families. Uh, if they have a dog, uh, they might not be able to bring their dog, but we can arrange daily visits with their animal. So we're doing everything we can to make people comfortable. Um, and uh, that's going to only become more important. I just hope we always do have a spot available for everyone who needs it. You talk about how municipalities are under a financial crunch right now because you own, you you have 60% of the infrastructure and only 9% of the taxes coming back to you. How do you balance that aspect of the job? Because I know FCM is calling for a new fiscal framework for municipalities to potentially have a better financial framework for themselves to move forward. But in the short term, I'm assuming you're going through budget cycle like every other municipality is, or you're about to go through a reevaluation of a four-year budget cycle, which some municipalities are under. Looking at everything that's going on right now, you have to make some pretty hard choices this year to say, okay, what are we going to cut? What are we going to keep? And how are we going to not increase our tax uh, load onto our, our mill rate onto our residents in a timely fashion, in a large fashion? Do you see Burlington up to the challenge of making sure that this budget cycle is not as impactful as potentially it needs to be? Yeah, it's a it is a tough uh, tough cycle for us in Burlington, um, even Halton Region as well, but Burlington especially. Um, we're looking at a pretty significant tax increase and overall increase. I think staff are bringing forward of around eight uh, percent. But when you realize how expensive the infrastructure has become to get these projects done, it's a question of do you want the municipality to fall behind? or to start to get ahead of our of our infrastructure gap ahead of the services that residents need as they as our as our municipality grows right like we just bought an old high school and we're converting it into a community center and that's happening in a near a go station because that's where so much of our growth is going to be and does that cost the residents yeah it costs them for sure but they'll they'll benefit from having that community center in the long run so like we said earlier, Chris, these are where you make those investments and then you have to uh, communicate and have two-way dialogue with your residents to explain why you're doing it. Burlington's had very low taxes. We have lower taxes in Hamilton than Oakville. Um, and we've gotten by lean for a long time, but the chickens are coming home to roost. The roads are not where they need to be. The infrastructure is just not where it needs to be. So I, I worry most about the infrastructure gap and the gap widening as the expenses get higher. And, you know, in order to, to tackle and be ready for climate change, we have to spend money as well um, and make those strategic investments that will pay off in the long run. So taxes are will be going up in Burlington. You heard it here first. Uh, we're not, it will not be a 0% tax year, that's for sure. Um, you talk about the climate uh, crisis and how Burlington is trying to respond to it or in one of the issues that you address, uh, you believe is uh, pre prevalent in Burlington. What What's the city doing and you uh, as deputy mayor and council doing to ensure that uh, the climate crisis, which is a national crisis, is a worldwide crisis, mm -hmm. gets sort of 
a leg up and people talk about it at a local level because traditionally it's more of a national issue that people are talking about and we always forget that locally we can do things to mitigate the climate crisis so what's burlington doing to mitigate the climate crisis locally right yeah you know we're trying to do our part for sure um we uh, had that climate emergency declaration in 2019 and we knew when we made the declaration uh, that that alone would not doesn't count for more than in the piece of paper it's written on but we were we had a climate action plan developed because of that the climate action plan has some projects and programming that will help so so for example um the hero program home energy retrofits we are just launching our pilot for 20 homes to uh, take part in a zero interest loan and i pushed hard for the loans to be at zero percent interest which nowadays you can't get anything for zero percent, right? <laughs> no. Uh, so you can now, as a Burlington resident, apply and have um, a um, have. Of course, I'm going to forget the word for it now. A uh, a new uh, a new uh, furnace uh, installed that is uh, that is. Oh my gosh, what's it, what's it called, Chris? Those uh, those the heat, furnaces. the pump the, heat pump the, heat pump. Yeah. Thank you. You can have a heat pump installed uh, and uh, and pay it back through your tax roll over 10 years. And you'll basically be paying over 10 years the savings you're going to have on your gas bill. So you won't feel a difference in your monthly fee. And then after 10 years, you'll have this uh, heat pump uh, that will uh, benefit you for decades to come and uh, benefit uh, the city by attacking uh, one of the biggest uh, causes of emissions of, of climate change, yeah, of, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I so just realized one way, but yeah. I just realized what time it is and I want to get to my last segment before I have to let you go here. And yeah. I want to talk about tourism for two seconds, if you, if you can, because I love tourism and I think municipalities uh, should be doing a better job. And this is just a broad stroke across all municipalities of promoting their tourist destinations, because I think Canadians should be spending their economic dollars in Canada, helping our great communities uh, thrive as a tour potential tourist to your community next spring, what should I be coming to see Burlington for? What are some of the hidden gems in your community that you want to make sure people stop in and see? Sure. Well, we got some hidden gems and some less hidden ones. Um, we have uh, we have the Sound of Music Festival every June. So that's in the spring. That's the largest free music festival in Canada. Have you ever been, Chris? I certainly have. All right. <laughs> I worked at Queens Park. I have been there numerous times. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, man, it's a good time. It is really. We we take this water our waterfront park, uh, the the jewel, one of the two jewels of our city, and uh, turn it into a festival. And uh, so I, you know, I recommend everyone come out to that. Uh, we have the largest rib fest uh, in Canada. So uh, I think we all know what what that entails. Um, and you know. We have a conservation halt in parks. Um, they, I wouldn't say those are hidden, but there are some great events there. For example, in two weeks, it's hops and harvest. So uh, it uh, it takes place in the conservation halt in park, uh, and uh, it's a beautiful scene. Always crisp uh, weather, and uh, it's uh, it's beer, it's um, it's music, it's vendors, it's great food, food trucks. Uh, so uh, that happens every year. Uh, Conservation Hall has great programming for families. They have Christmas, uh, the Christmas Town. Uh, they have the Maple Festival. So highly recommend. And we have Conservation Hall Halton Park in Burlington, Mount Nemo. It's a great place to get a view of, of the GTA. Great pictures there. Um, I want to leave on the million dollar question. And I think every municipal politician knows how to answer this question right off the top of the head, but I always like to put it on the record. In your opinion, what makes the city of Burlington such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, as someone who has a young family mm -hmm. now, I think one of the great things about Burlington is... Uh, it's still relatively easy to get around, to move from one place to another, whether it's the bus or biking or even in the vehicle uh, to get from one place to the other. Um, so you can get across the city in 15 or 20 minutes and it matters. But, you know, um, we've invested quite heavily into our parks. 
my uh, my number one uh, priority when I was elected in 2018 was to bring a splash pad into uh, my uh, War 3 community. And it's become a community gathering place. Um, it just was the last piece of the puzzle for that park. So there's a there's a level of community in Burlington. Uh, I was at an Italian Canadian club of Burlington event over the weekend. There's these community connections that fit for everyone from every walk of life. Um, Burlington just sits right in that sort of spot where we we're very lucky to be affluent, but we we have this character as well that I just uh, love about Burlington. Actually, we call it the Burlington bubble, um, and uh, you got to be careful not to not to let it burst uh, as much as possible. But um, everyone in Burlington loves to be here. Uh, Deputy Mayor, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this interview. Um, I appreciate you serving your community. I think uh, municipal politicians don't get thanked enough. So thank you for stepping up and making your community a better place. After our 45 minute interview, it seems like you're doing it for the right reason. So thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. And thank you for, for having me. And thanks for doing these, uh, doing these interviews and shedding light on the municipal uh, world. We need uh, more people like you out there. So thank you. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in diving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of the show. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page, conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, Stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.